divided it into territories that subsequently became states, and it said that there would not be slavery in this territory. So when it's handed back to the Americans, all of a sudden slaves from Canada are saying, wait a minute, we just have to make it across the Detroit River and we can find our freedom. And by the late 1790s, there is a steady trickle of slaves crossing the Detroit River, finding their way to the city of Detroit. And as they're finding their way there, it becomes problematic for Governor William Hull. So what I want to do is share with you the story of one of those slaves. Ultimately, I'm going to share with you three little short stories or vignettes. And the first one is of a guy named Peter Dennison. Have you heard of Peter Dennison? No? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Peter Dennison? No? I'd not heard of him either before I began this project. Uh, Peter Dennison was a slave who had lived in Detroit when the British controlled it, pre-1796. But when it was handed over to the Americans, he thought he would get his freedom. Well, the territorial judge, a man named Augustus Woodward, would rule that slaves that were held as early as 1793 would remain slaves after 1796. Peter Dennison remains a slave. And his owner was a woman named Catherine Tucker. And she owned a number of slaves. And by the early 19th century, Catherine Tucker was beginning to experience financial difficulties. She, was, she had slaves, she had land, she didn't have cash. And now there's this influx of slaves crossing over from Canada that are selling or brokering themselves as free labor and selling their services below the going rate so that they can make money. So Catherine Tucker finds herself even in worse shape because she can't rent her slaves out to someone without almost taking a loss. So in 1806, she decided that she would rent her slave, sign a contract with a guy named Elijah Brush. Brush is the, the mayor of Detroit. And according to the contract, Brush would have possession of Peter Dennison for one year. At the end of that year, Brush would give Dennison his freedom. And Catherine Tucker got to keep the money. Well, that one year was ending in the, the, uh, the early summer of 1807, right about the time of the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. And ultimately, Catherine Tucker cried out that she'd been defrauded. She'd been cheated by Elijah Brush. And she filed suit again in the territorial court. See him here? Judge Augustus Big Nose Woodward. <laughs> he ruled in favor of Catherine Tucker. Re-enslaved Peter Dennison. And then the news came to the northwest frontier of the attack on the Chesapeake. And there was the anticipation that the, the area would soon go to war. So what happens is William Hull, short of men, but having lots of runaway slaves there, decided to form a company of free black soldiers. And he asked Peter Dennison, who had gained some notoriety there in Detroit through this court case, he asked him to be the commander of this unit. Now you can imagine the white people there began raising hell about this. The idea that Peter, that uh, William Hull would arm runaway slaves, drill them there on the village green, and then expect them to defend white liberty. Well, they began writing letters to the mayor, to the governor, to the judge, to Secretary of State James Madison, to President Thomas Jefferson. You can find these letters where they're just purely raising hell because of what Hull had done. 
And there the militia was drilling day in and day out, thinking that they were about to go to war. Well, we don't go to war in 1807. We don't finally go to war until 1812, the summer of 1812. And when we do go to war, just as Hull had anticipated, Detroit would be the first, one of the first theaters of operation. And when the war is finally declared, Hull would call out the black militia again. Peter Dennison and his fellow black soldiers prepared for the defense of the city. Now you remember I said William Hull's name was synonymous with treason. Why? Because in August of 1812, William Hull surrendered Detroit to the British. He had his daughters there. He thought he was outnumbered. He thought the Indians were going just to run rampant over his forces and butcher and scalp them. So he decided to surrender it. And according to the, the provisions of the surrender, the officers and the soldiers were taken as captives into Canada. The militia were told to return home and not take up arms again against Great Britain. Peter Dennison was a militiaman. So he goes back to his life as a slave. Now, what happens to Peter Dennison as the war progresses? Not quite sure. This is the problem of, of trying to, to research individuals. They tend to fall through the cracks of time. But I can tell you that Peter Dennison does pop up on the radar list or radar screen again in the spring of 1816. Of all places, in a little community called Sandwich, just right across the Detroit River in Canada, a man named Peter Dennison. D-E-N-I-S-O-N Join the St. Catherine's Episcopal Church. This Peter Dennison had a wife named Hannah. Had four children, including a youngest daughter named Lisbeth. Now the Peter Dennison in Detroit, in that court case, spelled his name D-E-N-N-I-S-O-N. He had a wife named Hannah. He had four kids, the youngest of which was named Lizbeth. Do you think it's the same one? I bet my, my professional career that it was. And this Peter Dennison, with the one end in Canada, identified himself as a free man. He had used the chaos of war to cross over the Canadian border to find his freedom. Now, what we know is that the youngest, Lizbeth, she actually became somewhat wealthy during her lifetime. She worked for a number of pro prominent Detroit families, including the Biddle family, and she accumulated a considerable amount of wealth herself. And when she died, right about the time of the American Civil War, she deeded all of her wealth to create an Episcopal church on... Uh, Oh, God, the name of that island. I forgot the name of it. Right there in the middle of the river. And, what? Gross Hill. That's what it is. Gross Hill. I figured if you guys said enough, I might figure it out. So she created a church there and gave her wealth for that church. And you can still visit that church today. In fact, it's known as the first church in Michigan to be founded by a former slave. Now what you see in the case of Peter Dennison, he represents a time in Michigan history. A time that we don't normally talk about. When we talk about the Underground Railroad, we talk about a path to freedom that leads from the American South <coughs> north to the freedom of Canada. But literally from 1796 to 1815, that Underground Railroad is going in the opposite direction. It's flip-flopped. Now, if I say that in political terms, I mean, that's a scary thought. Somebody flip-flop. But this road does flip-flop. In fact, 1796 to 1815, it's going to the freedom of the American Northwest for those slaves escaping from Canada. But then, after, that's the beginning of this underground railroad that's leading north to freedom. And what you can say about Peter Dennison, he's literally there on the vanguard of this movement. So his story 
turns out to be a story of freedom. He made his choice with the Americans, but he found his freedom with the British in Canada. So his is a feel-good story. He found freedom. The second guy I want to tell you about, I'm sure you've heard of him too. His name is Charles Ball. Somebody's heard of, you know, I, I taught last year out in Maryland. Out there, everybody knows Charles Ball. Really, they do. Because he's one of those characters that they have enough information about, they're able to create a narrative about him. He was born in Calvert County, Maryland, about the year 1780. And he was owned by a series of masters. By the early part of the 19th century, he was owned by a man named Levin Ballard. It was a particularly hateful man treated Charles Ball poorly, didn't feed him enough, beat him. But the one thing that Levin Ballard did, he let Charles Ball work as a laborer for the U.S. Navy at the Washington Navy Yard. And Charles Ball served as a cook aboard the, the, uh, the frigate USS Congress. And for about a year and a half, he was a cook there. And during that time, Charles Ball began crafting a plan to skate and find his freedom. And every time he was about to put his plan into motion, something happened and it didn't, didn't work out. And then, Levin Ballard called him home and treated him poorly. And by 1807, had sold him south to a slave dealer who took him to South Carolina. And another sell resulted in his being taken south to Georgia. By this time, Charles Ball was 27. He had a wife and a couple of kids, and he had been pulled away from his family. Now, Charles Ball would write an autobiographical memoir. It would be published in 1838. And he said in that memoir that when he was sold in 1807, he was able to escape from his plantation in Georgia, traveling only by the light of the stars, living off the land, it takes himself about a year and a half to make his way back to Calvert County, Maryland. And my first question was, why in the hell does he go back to Calvert County? That's where he'd been, that hateful man, that hateful owner had sold him. Well, think about it. He had a wife and children, and he wanted to be near them. And by the time he got back, about 189, Levin Ballard was dead. And the surprising thing was that the, the other local farmers and planters began to hire Charles Ball as a free laborer. And they rallied around Charles Ball and protected him. Now, he worked as a free man. He bought property. He was a fisherman, a farmer. And I, I used to say he had kids. Actually, his wife had kids. He helped with that, but. And he seemed to be living a prosperous life until the War of 1812 came to the Chesapeake. And the war was particularly hard on the Chesapeake, especially Virginia and Maryland. Uh, beginning in the spring of 1813, British ships were raiding the coastline of Virginia and Maryland. And for the better part of a year and a half, they wreaked havoc, they burned plantations. The British commanders, uh, this guy here, he's the overall commander, Alexander Cochran. His subordinate is, a, is also a, an admiral, but also a colonel in the Royal Marines. His name's George Coburn, spelled like Cockburn. And they would simply send boats ashore to raid plantations. And if you put up any resistance, they would burn your farm. If you didn't put up resistance, they would simply requisition and take what they needed. Now, they would pay you something, but it was certainly not face value. So you were caught between this proverbial rock and the hard spot. And think about it. If you were a plantation owner, you had slaves, and the British are out there. You can see them, and the local militia is called out. And you're a part of the local militia. You grab your musket, and you go out to meet the enemy, and you're having to always look over your shoulder because... As the British come closer, slaves became more active. They were eager to find their way to the British and find their freedom. So these American planters were damned if they do and they were damned if they didn't. 
So with Charles Ball, in the spring of 1813, Calvert County had been racked by British raids. And a group of white plantation owners decided they would visit the British fleet at anchor in the Chesapeake and plead with their slaves to come back. And they asked Charles Ball if he would accompany them. He did. So they visited the fleet in early June. And of course these plantation owners are telling their slaves that they had a good life and bondage and that they should willingly come back to experience the joys of life. Yes. Guess how many chose to come back? Zero. Well, they asked Charles Ball if he would stay the night aboard the ship and mingle with the slaves and convince them that it was in their best interest to come back. Charles Ball did it. Stayed there with the slaves, mingled about amongst them the following morning. Now guess how many are returning? Zero. And as Charles Ball was getting off the ship, this is the seminal point in Charles Ball's life. When he wrote his autobiography, he didn't even acknowledge that it was the seminal point of his life. But with a historian's insight, you know, with perspective, you can look at his entire life and say, this is when his life changed. A British officer said to him, do you want to join us as a free man in a British colony? And Charles Ball said, no, sir, I am a free man. I have all the land to work that I can work. Charles Ball had fabricated an identity for himself. He thought of himself as a free man. And in reality, he was a fugitive slave. But he thought he was free. Well, the following year, Charles Ball would join the U.S. Navy. The British operating from Tangier Island there in the southern part of the bay, they would ultimately liberate more than... 2,000 slaves from the Chesapeake. And the British were very good about loading them aboard ship and whisking them off to Bermuda as quickly as possible. And when supply ships came in, the soldiers were offloaded, the supplies were offloaded, the slaves were unloaded, and the ship was on its way back. Charles Ball joined with the American Naval Flotilla there in the uh, under command of Joshua Barney. And if you know what happened to his flotilla, Barney harassed the British for the better part of four months, trying to keep the British offshore and trying to constantly keep the British off guard. But finally, the British, by sheer force of numbers, decided they were going to attack, and their objective was the American capital. So Barney's flotilla constantly retreated up a little, you know, in Alabama we'd call it a crick, but in uh, Maryland, they call it a river. It's the Patuxent River. You know, I grew up in North Alabama. There's a little thing called Slab Creek, and it was about the size of the Patuxent River. So I think here in Alabama, we need to rename our waterways and give them a more impressive sounding name. But Barney retreated up the Patuxent to a point where his boats would no longer float. He destroyed his ships, and the men, the men gathered what they could, and they beat a hasty retreat nine miles to the Washington Navy Yard. And when they got there, they learned that the British were advancing on the nation's capital. So then they grabbed field artillery and pulled them six miles out to a place called Bladensburg. Now, if you're traveling in Washington area today, it's just right inside the Beltway, the Eastern Beltway. And there, the Americans took up a position there along a small creek. There was a small bridge that crossed the creek and Barney's art flotilla men were manning their artillery on a high point to the back, to the rear of the American line. And as the British crossed the creek, Barney's artillery just weighed into them repeatedly, shot after shot. And Charles Ball said in his memoir that when those British soldiers fell, another one closed in the gap that they were so disciplined and so well trained that they didn't miss a beat as they were coming up that hill. And eventually the Americans broke and ran. Barney and his, his flotillamen stayed there firing their guns until Barney was wounded and he fell down. 
And as he fell down, he ordered his men to spike their guns and to retreat. Charles Ball was a sponger on a cannon. That meant that every time the cannon was fired, he took his sponge, put it in the water, down the barrel to pull out the hot embers, and then they would reload it and fire again. Well, he drops his sponge, and instead of running back towards Washington like the rest of the Americans did, you know, they called it the Bladensburg Races, because they ended up racing through Washington on to Georgetown. Well, Charles Ball walked directly into the British lines. And no one shot at him. No one tried to injure him. He looked like a refugee who was trying to find his freedom. And he would walk through the British attack and ultimately make his way toward Baltimore. Well, the British, you know what happened there. They kind of found their way to Washington, D.C. They had a big bonfire. They torched public buildings. My favorite is this guy, the admiral in charge, George Coburn. He descended on the Washington National Intelligence or a newspaper there and he ordered his men to tear up the printing presses and destroy every letter C in their typeface. It's hard to write the word C-O-C-K without the letter C. Well, and they had been vilifying him for months so this was his way of getting back at them. About two weeks later, the British would make their assault on Baltimore. And it would be there that the Americans were prepared for this British attack. They had defended the city and there was a large fort at the entrance of the bay. The British weren't able to bring their ships into the inner harbor because of Fort McHenry. And over the course of 36 hours, about September 12th, the British fired on Fort McHenry. A, an attorney from Annapolis was forced to watch the engagement and he was so distraught that he sat down to write a poem. You know, a poem, I can't even, I can't even say the poem, I'd have to sing it to you. And I can't sing that well, so I'm not going to. It was called The Defense of Fort McHenry. It later becomes the Star Spangled Banner and subsequently in the early 20th century our national anthem. Charles Ball was in the outer American defenses there. He helped defend Baltimore. And with the victory there, Charles Ball was able to return to Calvert County. He prospered. He did well. Until about 1830, when a slave trader came through the neighborhood and claimed that he recognized Charles Ball from 25 years before. Slapped him in chains drug him back to Georgia. Now, Ball claimed that he was able to again escape his, his bondage, found his way to freedom. Took him about a year to get back this time. And when he got back, his wife and his children both had been dragged off into slavery. Charles Ball, from 1830 to 1838, he said he spent every penny he had trying to find his wife and his kids. Now Charles Ball could have avoided that. Charles Ball could have... Well, when that British officer asked him if he wanted to go as a free man in a, to a British colony, he could have said, Yes, sir, let me go get the little lady and the kids and we'll be right back. But he had fabricated that identity for himself and his fabricated identity of being a free man came back to haunt him by the 1830s. And he, he spent the last part of his life looking for his wife and kids. So his freedom story was somewhat less joyous than had been Peter Denison's. Now the last guy I want to tell you about is a guy named Ned Simmons. Now, have you heard of Ned Simmons? No? Okay. That doesn't surprise me. Ned Simmons was a slave owned by General Nathaniel Green. And during the American Revolution, he served at Green's side. He was a, a fine soldier. He was also a, a fifer, played the fife. And reportedly played his fife on two occasions for George Washington in a private audience. After the Revolution, Green acquires 
land on Cumberland Island, Georgia. And he would set up his plantation there. It called uh, Dungeness Plantation. He brings Ned Simmons with him. And from the early 1780s to the late 1780s, Ned Simmons was, yes, a, a slave, but because Nathaniel Green lived, he didn't have such a hard life. But by the mid to late 1780s, Nathaniel Green had died. And the slaves began being debated, or the family disputed who should have ownership of the slaves. And they passed from family member to family members over the course of two decades. And Ned Simmons loses his prized position among the slaves and is forced to be a common laborer again. Well, his life remained as such, governed by the seasons, the change of the, uh, the, the, change of the year, the change of the seasons, the rhythms of life, so to speak, until the War of 1812 came to Cumberland Island. You okay? You okay? Okay. I didn't mean to get you all choked up. Well... The War of 1812 comes to Cumberland Island in January of 1815. Now my students are always quick to point out, but Dr. Smith, the war was over by then. You know, they signed that peace agreement in Ghent on Christmas Eve, 1814, so the war was finished. Yes, the war was over, but both sides have to ratify the agreement. And it doesn't make it to the United States until mid-February, and it would subsequently be ratified. The British ratified about... A little, a little earlier than that. And it, news of it doesn't get to the, the South Atlantic until mid-March. So in January, George Coburn, the guy who burned Washington, he begins operating in the South Atlantic. It's all part of a concerted campaign against New Orleans. And when he lands on Cumberland Island, begins liberating slaves, Ned Simmons is one of the first to take the opportunity to become a British soldier. In fact, he would immediately, he would immediately sign his name to Coburn's muster roll as a British soldier. And what Coburn, Coburn commented about him in his letters, he said, this guy Ned Simmons is an outstanding soldier. Well, she's think about it, he fought in the revolution. By this point in time, he was about 65. He could drill, he knew how to handle a weapon. And in fact, because he had this erect military bearing, Coburn said, I will keep him here on Cumberland Island in uniform with his weapon to serve as an example to every slave that makes it to the island what they too can accomplish. How many slaves are evacuated from Cumberland Island? About 1,700. And there is Ned Simmons serving as an example. Well, that was the problem. Because American peace commissioners arrive on the island in mid-March and they're demanding that Coburn turn over all seized property, including slaves. And Coburn would argue with these American commissioners for a better part of a week. And when he finally gave in, he said, I will give all slaves that are still here on the island, I will return them. But those that have been evacuated from the island, and during that week, lots of slaves were evacuated. But those that were still on the island, they would be returned to their masters. Ned Simmons would be returned to his master. And according to the family's oral tradition, when they stripped him of his weapon, stripped him of his uniform, they took his red coat off of him, and he held on to it. He, they literally had to pry it out of his hands. And when they did, they pulled it away from him. He had a brass button. He pulled it off the coat, trying to hold on to it. The family claims that that had been a prized possession of Ned Simmons. Well, Ned Simmons would eventually get his freedom. When? 1863. Ned Simmons is about 103 at the time. And according to his own account, 
he and his 70 year old daughter in, eight, in the early part of 1863 they would flee across Cumberland Island to Fernandina where Union forces had occupied the city and when they arrived there the forces these Union troops gave them food gave them shelter there were missionary women there and they began to work with these slaves and try to teach several of them to read Ned Simmons learned to read at 103 and as he told his story people were surprised this is a slave who had been owned by Nathaniel Green this was a slave who on at least four occasions had met George Washington so a newspaper reporter came over and recorded the story so now we know what had happened because of the newspaper reporter taking it from the mouth of Ned Simmons in the last interview he gave he said if I were to die today I could at least go to heaven knowing I'm a free man he died about two weeks later he had taken him 103 years to get his freedom and he did die as a free man but the interesting thing is that in the 1990s the US Park Service began doing excavations on the slave cabins at Dungeness Plantation and in the largest slave cabin they uncovered of all things a brass button from a British 1808 uniform the family's oral tradition was confirmed I've seen this button it sits in a a drawer for the National Park Service in Jacksonville they should put it on display somewhere because the family still values this there are hundreds of other slaves that would ultimately try to get their freedom just south of here when the British would attack along the Gulf Coast would attack Fort Boyer there on Mobile Point in September of 1814 Colonel Edward Nichols British Colonel Edward Nichols would use slaves former slaves and renegade Indians to attack the American position and in that attack that begins on the 12th and culminates on September 15th the British were going to lose a, a frigate called the HMS Hermes it's the only time in the war that a land fortification sunk a British frigate well that attack failed but by February of 1815 the British came back to Fort Boyer and would eventually take that position ultimately liberating about 300 slaves from across the Gulf Coast now as I began this book many many years ago I thought it was a, really a story about black combatants I thought it was a story about how blacks fought in the war but what I realized it's not a war it's not a book about war per se it's a book about freedom and how people use the chaos of war to try to find their freedom and what I've given you there are three vignettes three short stories there are hundreds of other stories the slave Cyrus Tiffany the slave former slave Richard Cephas who is at Dartmoor prison the British attack on Washington the British West Indian Marines and of course the slaves that Andy Jackson would co-opt into his forces in fact Jackson wins at New Orleans because he's able to convince free blacks two regiments of free men of color to fight for him at New Orleans and he's able to convince slaves that they should side with him by promising him promising them their freedom well he ultimately doesn't give them their freedom and that's one of the the black marks on Jackson one of many on Jackson <laughs> what happened to those that are liberated well ultimately about 4800 will be liberated and taken away from the coast of America they're initially taken to the island of Bermuda the British are very efficient about transporting refugees Bermuda is a holding depot they they stay there for a very short period of time and then they will be loaded aboard ships and taken to Halifax hopefully a group of about a thousand end up in Trinidad
In fact, there's still a community in Trinidad to this day that refer to themselves as Merkins. M-E-R-I-K-E-N-S. Merkins. And they are the descendants of those slaves that got their freedom. In fact, the, the wife, a woman named Hazel Manning, of a former prime minister, was a part of this Merkin community. Those that end up in Halifax and in Trinidad, well, they're going to have hard lives economically. But the one thing they had that the Americans did not have, they had freedom. Ultimately what happens, as I began this book, I hoped that the War of 1812 would be not only a freedom story for those that are evacuated, but I was hoping I'd see some evidence that there was this movement that begins in the American Revolutionary period. When Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That unleashes these revolutionary forces. And I'd hoped that as we move closer to the War of 1812, that there would be the, the prospect. You could see evidence of states moving toward manumission of their slaves. And you see that across the northern states. The War of 1812 destroys that in the South once and for all. In fact, what happens is the British show that you can use slaves as soldiers. You can use slaves as a fifth column to threaten the South, whether it be Virginia or Maryland or whether it be the Carolinas or Georgia or even along the Gulf Coast. And afterwards, Americans are going to become much more rigid in their attitudes about racial equality and slavery. In fact, what you see across the South is that Southerners, instead of, instead of lessening or loosening the bonds of slavery, they're going to tighten the bonds of slavery. And what especially happens from this area across to Louisiana is the opening up of the Old South, the Cotton Kingdom, a kingdom that is going to be based on the labor of others. This is a result of the War of 1812 because the opening up of this land, driving the Indians out and, and certainly keeping the slaves under control. Had that not happened, it would have been a much different story. So ultimately this really becomes a story about trying to find freedom. And I, I choose to conclude here with that song I couldn't sing because I can't say the words. You know, there is a series of five verses of that song. We only sing the first verse. The third verse has an interesting series of lines in it. And it starts there where it says, Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. The hireling enslaved, well, those were those black soldiers that the British had liberated and put arms in their hands and used them to fight against the Americans. And it even makes it into Francis Scott Key's poem about the defense of Fort McHenry. So with that note, I'll go ahead and conclude here today. If you want to ask a question, you make up a question, I'll make up an answer, and we'll come to some conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All yes, right. Yes. Oh, we do have some microphones. We just ask that you speak into them so that it's recorded. Uh, how are you doing, Dr. I'm, I'm great. You? Uh, what were the native... Uh, I was reading... I read a lot of stuff. Okay. I'm sure you're familiar with William A.P.'s. Uh, he was a Native American writer in the North uh -huh. back in the day. But anyway, what were the Natives doing at that time? Well, in fact, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I, when I began this book, I was convinced that if we're talking about why slaves joined one side or the other, it was a dichotomy that they joined either with the Americans or they joined with the British. But yikes, I found out it was far more complicated than that. In fact, it ultimately becomes as many as five options. They joined with the Americans, or they joined with the British. They joined with the Spanish, you know, along the Gulf South. And then they joined with Native American communities. And then they 
They also joined in with renegade maroon or runaway slave communities. So there were as many as five options for slaves. And each one of them are trying in their own right to preserve what they viewed as most valuable, and that was their, their freedom. So, one more question. When you say slaves, are you talking about African slaves, native slaves? They're not, they're not look. native slaves. Okay. They are, by this point in time, they're African Americans. They're black slaves that had been Americanized. Okay. Yes, sir. Smith, um, just curious to know, between black refugees, <laughs> okay, thanks. Between black refugees and black loyalists, were there different and where would oh, yeah, Simmons and Balls <laughs> and Simmons Ball and uh, the other gentleman fit in one of those two categories? Yeah, uh, one of the things I don't talk about in my talk, but I certainly deal with in my book, is um, there's at least three migratory movements of of uh, former slaves to British colonies. You know, there's a loyalist from the period of the American Revolution. They see themselves as the, the pure. And then there's a group from the 1790s that are refugees from the slave insurrections in the Caribbean. They find their ways to America, but also to, to British Canada. And then there's this group from the War of 1812 that when they arrive in Canada, they are viewed as, you know, you... Uh, you country bumpkins. You know, you are the guys who you have no real skills. You're, you're field hands. You know, most of the loyalists from the American Revolutionary period, they saw themselves as, you know, domestics, house servants. So it was a question of how they viewed themselves on the social, the social scale of, of hierarchy. And the, the ones from the War of 1812, most of them were field hands. And they, because those were the ones that could most easily escape. Um, now those who end up in Trinidad, it was an interesting, interesting paradox because there was slavery on the island of Trinidad. And can you imagine these, these former slaves being evacuated to Trinidad for about seven years or saying, no thank you, we don't want to go. Canada's just fine. And then by 1823, there's a group of them saying, God dang, it gets cold in Canada. And you know, the land is just not that good. Okay, I'll take my chance. I'll go to Trinidad. Well, the British government puts them right in the middle of the island and basically is betting them that you can't survive in the middle of the island. Well, what they find that they have to do, they're constantly having to work the land because if you don't work the land, the jungle just grows back over you. So it was a gamble, and most of them spend the rest of their life kind of toiling and working to survive there on Trinidad. And by the 1850s, the uh, Trinidadian government is actually finally awarding them private ownership of land. But by that point in time, the British had, had abolished slavery throughout the empire. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right you mentioned the start of the day uh, the criminal ship would not consider an American citizen. About what year would that change? What year would uh, would African Americans be able to serve legally aboard ships? Be an American citizen. Oh, be, after the uh, 14th Amendment? Okay. So 1860, 66, 67? So yeah, it's... Uh, but, you know, the practice is actually much different. I mean, in fact, at the time of the War of 1812, it's estimated that anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of of American, quote unquote, American sailors were black. And the thing I often point out, when I certainly when I taught at the Naval Academy, what uh, when you serve aboard ship, a, a ship is like a, a finely tuned instrument or a finely tuned piece of machinery. Everybody has a duty or a function. And if one person screws up, then the entire ship can be at peril. So what you see is that in the maritime world, it's not so important what your skin color is. It's more important, can you do your job? And if you can't do your job, and you say you can, then you're probably going to be whipped and thrown overboard. It doesn't matter if you're white, red, black, yellow. <laughs>
My my question, and I, I saw your video, one of your videos. Hey, uh, that was a handsome guy. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, and I I enjoyed it, and I you know looked up the Trinidad stuff. Okay, and, good. And uh, got a friend from Trinidad, but eighteen. What is eighteen oh nine when the British government? Outlaw slavery. No, they don't outlaw slavery until 1833. Well, the history books, they keep... Well, the British, you know, it's interesting. The British government and the American government, both in 1807, will outlaw the international slave trade. And the British, they will... Um, they outlawed slavery in the empire in 1833, thanks to the efforts of William Wilberforce. Now, one of the interesting things I found in this as I did this study is that many of these these naval commanders that are operating along the coast of America many of them are proto-abolitionists this guy Edward Nichols I told you he's a great supporter of William Wilberforce two decades later and and George Coburn who goes on to fame as a as the uh, the governor of India so I mean he has a long career and he's a he's a proto-abolitionist as well and a great supporter of William Wilberforce so what you have in the case of these naval commanders I'm convinced my friends who do army history just kind of scoff at me when I say this naval commanders they see the larger picture and they understand the geographic they understand the strategic army commanders wear blinders and they only see the tactical and the operational that's right in front of them and most of them are not broad-minded. Most army commanders are not broad-minded in the 19th century. I'm not going to I'm not going to pass judgment on them in the 21st century. <laughs> One little quick thing that I, I found in my research recently when I'm, I'm doing my uh, you know I'm searching. I'm searching. So I go to Welcome the to our world. We're yeah. always searching. Yeah. I'm, 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 and I run across this uh, headstone with a naval symbol on it. Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. And An anchor or a ship. Yeah. yeah. So uh, shortly, well, after my research, I found out about Mare Island Naval Base. Oh, Mare California. Island off the coast of California. You're right. Yeah. And uh, in 1851, Yeah, it was founded in the early 50s. In fact, <laughs> you know, it's interesting you meant... <laughs> I didn't pay this guy. Uh, I wrote a, a biography of a naval officer named Thomas App Catesby Jones. He's at the Battle of New Orleans uh, in 1814, and then in the time of the Mexican War, he's out on the coast of California. He found some naval station there at Mare Island. So if you want that biography, just look it up on Amazon. You can get it, and you can learn all about Mare Island. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm afraid you may have already addressed it, but the circled stands over there. Yep, yep. Uh, I... I Get the impression is was he pro-slavery, Mr. Key? Yes, he was. So he's he's uh, denigrating those that escape from their proper exactly. condition. Well, and in fact, there, there's a whole there's a whole group of uh, of American planters that are doing nothing but um, casting this in a negative tone. They're saying that the British, yes, the British are liberating slaves, but they're really not liberating them. They're taking them off to Bermuda, and they're re-enslaving them. They're selling them again. And in fact, Admiral, Co uh, Co Admiral Cochran, the commander of the station, he owned a plantation in Trinidad, and he would be charged repeatedly that he was liberating these slaves to take to his plantation in Trinidad, and he has to constantly fight that in the court systems for the better part of two years. Oh, uh, well, uh, what were we going Key. Francis Scott Key. Oh, oh the, the last stanza. Yep. Uh, and this be our motto? Was, was he quoting an existing motto, or did he coin that motto? Which no, it, that's an existing existing motto. Yeah, he's quoting something. Yeah, he's quoting something else. Okay, we are at the hour, so if anyone has any other questions, Dr. Smith is available to yep. chat or have your book signed. But thank you all for coming, and thank hope you so to see much. you again in 2015. Thank you so much. And thank it's you, Dr. Smith.